Hi and welcome to Physio Tutors podcast episode 52 with Andrew Cuff. Andrew is a consultant physiotherapist from the UK with a special interest in the upper limb and particularly the shoulder, which is also the reason he has created a course on the stiff shoulder, the elbow and wrist for physio tutors together with Thomas Mitchell. He's in the process of finishing his PhD this year on imaging for musculoskeletal conditions in primary care at Kiel University. So he's the perfect person to talk to about imaging. Hi, Andrew. Welcome to the podcast. Great to talk to you. Hi, Kai. Really hi. Thank you for inviting me. Really looking forward to talking about imaging. Sure. Thank, thanks a lot for being our guest today. Um, and I want to start by talking about the paper that you guys published. So you guys wrote a scoping review about the guidelines for the use of diagnostic imaging in MSK pain conditions affecting the lower back, knee and shoulder. And your results say diagnostic imaging should be reserved for when specific or serious pathology is suspected or where the person is not responding to initial non-surgical management and the imaging result is expected to change clinical management decision. And I would like to take that sentence and discuss several parts of it. So my first question would be, if your results or what you mentioned are the ideal scenario, how close or far away are we from this in real life? Excellent. No, yeah, cool. Good, good question. Um, I'll probably just kind of frame the the kind of the scope of the review because I think that's probably important to to help with the transfer of findings into practice. Um, so our scope and review is looking at clinical practice guidelines. Um, that were produced either in the UK um, or internationally that were applicable to UK practice. Um, reason being the rest of the, the kind of PhD was set within that, that UK setting. So um, with an international audience, it's probably important to just be mindful when my response is probably going to come from a, from a UK perspective mm. um, and therefore it should be considered whether or not that's relevant to, to other healthcare settings. And um, But we looked at clinical practice guidelines and to be a clinical practice guideline, um, there's a there's a clear definition. It needs to be based upon a systematic review of evidence and then the recommendations essentially coming out from there. So our re- guidelines, well, or documents that would call themselves guidelines, um, aren't always meeting that criteria. So we were quite strict in terms of, of what we included. The reason why we included a wide range of conditions, so back pain, knee pain and shoulder pain, was to try to get a bit of a flavour in terms of any similarities or differences between the kind of the the spinal presentations or axial presentations and the periphery, so upper limb or lower limb. Um, That meant that we had to put some conditions or some kind of boundaries on the review just to make it manageable. Mm -hmm. So we kept it to only include non-traumatic musculoskeletal conditions. So again, equally, what I'm about to say probably doesn't refer to traumatic presentations, um, whereby the recommendations imaging might be slightly different. So really clear cut, I think, in terms of guidelines. Don't use it routinely. Use it if you're considering serious or specific pathology, and then use it if it's if the person's not responding to first line treatment and the results are expected to change management. And I think the key part of the sentence related to your question of does this reflect real life is probably that second bit of and is it expected to change management? Um, And that's the bit where I think we probably we probably fall down. So we probably see in practice that someone's not responding to treatment, they're not getting better, and then before we do it, we do an image without thinking, is this going to change what we necessarily do next? Um, and we might come on to, to talking a little bit about this in terms of some of the, the future direction of, of of the PhD, whereby um, we did took some interviews with, with clinicians about how they utilise imaging. And one of the things that were really interesting that kind of came out of, of those interviews was that the reason why at times, one of the reasons why they request imaging is to... This concept of change management it came out... Um, within that I was talking a lot about essentially looking at an invasive next step as so whether that be to inform the decision to inject or inform the decision to, to operate um, and what was really interesting was that as part of that decision making process there was a consistent 
kind of theme of the patient need to be involved in that decision and be willing to undergo the invasive next step. So if a person was presenting with signs and symptoms that may respond to an injection or may be amenable to an operation, if they weren't willing to undergo said injection or said operation, then a clinician wouldn't order the imaging. And what's interesting, therefore, is that doesn't come out in the guidelines in terms of the patient consideration or the patient involvement mm-hmm. in the decision, um, which is interesting, particularly as we, we look at the kind of the personalised care movement, which is increasingly looking to include the patient as part of that decision-making process. Okay. And, and, and uh, can we put any numbers uh, on how often imaging is requested per patient at the moment and... and Maybe uh, what 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 would be the ideal scenario? Yeah, cool. Uh, I think that's really tricky to answer, um, and I don't think there's anything out there in terms of what's the ideal. Um, but I could probably talk a little bit loosely around it in terms of, again, probably from a a UK perspective. But I think the same is being seen similarly kind of worldwide. And I'll touch upon some international data as well. So in terms of numbers, what we are seeing is that the use of diagnostic imaging continues to rise around the world. Um, a lot of this data comes from Australia, a lot of this data comes from America. So again, we've got to be a little bit mindful in terms of um, kind of application to that in terms of all healthcare settings. But we're seeing the use of MRI for back pain largely has increased by about 50% in A&E settings across, in, in Australia. Um, and we're increasingly seeing rates for you know, ultrasound, x-ray and MRI going up for non-traumatic MSK pain. From a UK setting, uh, in the National Health Service, we've seen over the last five years between 2013 and COVID, because COVID had a, a bit of an impact upon service delivery, that year on year, the amount of imaging went up by about 20% in, in mm. total. It kind of flatlined during imaging, as you would expect, as healthcare services um, kind of shut down. And then typically now what we're seeing is a really interesting tension between previous kind of system and clinical agendas um, and this concept or of, of kind of COVID recovery. So if we think pre-COVID, there was a bit of a focus on trying to reduce diagnostic spend, only use diagnostics appropriately. And now in the UK, there's a target for the NHS to do or complete 120% of imaging to pre-COVID levels. So we're saying that there was a problem pre-COVID, we're imaging too much, mm. we're spending too much on imaging. Um, but now as part of a measure of are we getting back to where we were pre-COVID, we're saying we need to be doing over 120% of, of what we were doing before. There's a bit of a tension there. And that tension largely relates to uh, an assumption that increased imaging is a better performing healthcare service as we, as we kind of get back to normality it doesn't talk about how appropriate that imaging is. And as soon as you put a measure, the clinicians, health services, hospitals, private clinics, et cetera, will change their activity or change their practice to hit that hit that measure. And um, so that, that kind of tension around appropriateness is, is, is really interesting. Now, all of this comes back down to the, the fundamental question, I think, which is, does it matter that imaging rates are, are going up? Does it matter that we're spending more money on imaging? And I would say it does, because the evidence is quite clear that despite increases in, in imaging, essentially year on year, we're not seeing a change in you know improvement in outcomes. So we're seeing persistent pain on the increase. We're seeing um, complexity of long-term conditions on the increase. We're seeing years, years live with disability, with back pain, for example, not coming down. Um, so I'd argue it does matter, because we're spending more. We're probably aware of some of the potential iatrogenic or nocebic effects in imaging and we're not seeing that reflect in improved outcomes for patients yeah thanks for your answer i think you you already mentioned a couple of points that we will uh, get into in in a minute when we talk about the uh, cons of uh, the increase of imaging and uh, what do you think is the reason we don't seem to stick to guidelines i mean the guidelines say don't uh, request imaging if you don't suspect uh, serious pathology or if you think management is going to change why, why do you think we don't stick to those guidelines yeah so of course a really good question um and if i knew the answer to that i probably would have stopped my phd a year ago <laughs> <laughs> um but i i think there's there's a number of factors a number of reasons as to why clinical practice doesn't always reflect kind of what guidelines 
uh, recommend. And I think we, one of the things we need to acknowledge is that guidelines aren't dogmatic in the sense they should be rigidly applied. There are definitely times in, in clinical practice we know patients are complex, we know clinical practice is is increasing in terms of complexity, that the guidelines themselves may not readily apply to the person in front of us. So that warranted variation, um, I think, is 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 something we need to consider. We won't always, we won't get 100% guideline-based care. And I, and, I, and I think achieving that well, is, is, is probably impossible, mm. but we should be striving to be as close to that as, as we can, with the exception of those, those warranted cases. Why do I think practice is therefore different to, to clinical practice? Uh, sorry, why do we think practice isn't reflective of guidelines? There, there seems to be a number of factors. One is around the complexity of, of patients increasing, um, and, and that on a background of ever-increased time pressures, whether that be appointment lengths, whether that be waiting lists, um, whether that be trying to do more than a consultation without necessarily taking stuff out. Um, and that finds that leads itself to pressure. For some of the qualitative work that we've been doing is is clearly identified that time is a is a factor. And not in isolation, but particularly that there's strong patient expectations mm. for imaging. So if a person comes through and they're really expecting um, a, a scan or an image, then the clinicians would, and this is what comes through from the data, engage in that conversation, particularly if they felt that imaging wasn't appropriate. But the outcome of that conversation varies, um, and it varies based upon factors such as fatigue. So if you've had three or four of those conversations in a day, that when the fifth one comes along, how much energy yeah. do you have as a human being, as well as a clinician, to engage in that conversation? Um, and equally, if you've got a certain amount of time left with the, with the patient, you've got a list of patients that you're then due to then come on and see, how readily the, the, the patient kind of buys into the, the concept of not having an imaging for their, for their presentation. So most of the clinicians say they would engage in it, if a clinician, if a patient was was fairly on board, then they would go down a, a kind of an agreed route that didn't involve imaging. If the person was still strongly expecting it, still pushing back, then the clinicians were likely to undertake the imaging or refer for for imaging as a means to to put it get fairly bluntly to to ensure the patient left the clinic room and to get on with the rest of their rest of their clinic. And um, so these factors are, are clearly clearly involved. There's elements of of uncertainty that comes in this relates to that point around patient complexity so um, if a clinician is not clear about the person's presentation and particularly if they're considering kind of a red flag pathology or specific pathology and they couldn't assure themselves through subjective means or the objective examination um, that they were likely to do an image to reassure themselves that they weren't missing anything and there's elements here of kind of medical legal concerns, of kind of negligence concerns. Um, but related to that, there's this concept of imaging to reassure yourselves you're, you're not missing something. But that's getting increasingly harder because patients are coming through with more complex presentations, more chronic presentations, number of comorbidities, number of multimorbidities, um, difficulty in terms of health literacy. So comprehending the question that a clinician might ask, understanding what's being asked, providing an answer that helps the clinician satisfy themselves where their kind of level of concern or index of suspicion is before they make the next step. When that becomes harder and it becomes more difficult for the clinician to, to reason through their level of concern, then there's a tend to therefore undertake the imaging so as to be fairly objective in terms of missing something yes or yes or no. And that seems to relate in terms of variability, clinician by clinician, in terms of how risk tolerant they are, how much risk they're willing to, to accept, how much uncertainty they're willing to sit with. Um, and I don't think as a profession, as physiotherapists, we're very good at sitting with uncertainty. We can learn a lot from our medical colleagues, our GP practice, our general practitioners, our medical doctors, who sit with uncertainty and risk a hell of a lot more. And there's something here around... Um, kind of professional evolution as we see things such as first contact practice or direct access where we're being increasingly exposed to more risk 
and we probably need to think about other ways that we can tolerate said risk without defaulting to the use of imaging. Yeah, it's funny that you say that uh, about uncertainty because I think two days ago, Andres and I talked uh, about uh, yeah being able to tolerate uncertainty as one of the yeah maybe one of the most important qualities that you can have uh, in another podcast where we were the guests. Um, so, so I fully agree with that, and and I also feel like uh, if a patient comes in and and, and they they would like uh, an an image. Uh, and and you don't agree that that's a very hard conversation to have. So so I agree with the points that that you mentioned. Um, I, I want to have a look at uh, the whole physiotherapeutic process, and that's probably going to be connected with the pros of taking an image. So uh, if you look at the whole physiotherapeutic process, uh, when does imaging make sense? Okay, well, yeah. So I'll, I'll probably. The default back to my, my previous answer which is where the the guidelines come in i i think we overuse imaging um i don't think we include the patient enough in the decision to make to proceed with with imaging or not um so i don't think we should be using it routinely i think that's for that, that's clear so for majority of patients i think you asked previously and um, what's the ideal number of, of patients we should be imaging on um, I wouldn't say it's ideal, but I can share some data in that the the service that I work in or the, the organization I work for, uh, about 4% yeah. of our patients un- undergo imaging. Um, and we see just shy of half a million patients a year. So you could probably work backwards f- from there. And I think we're we're probably on the, the lower side of our, of our diagnostic use. So I w- don't think it needs to be used routinely. I think if we're, if there's a good indication regarding or level of concern and regarding serious pathology yeah. then i think in that circumstance under imaging is is less desirable i think as a as a profession and as kind of allied health professionals more broadly we're generally pretty good to understand the limitations of, of imaging we, we, we tend to not over investigate as much as other professions although i still think we could do better if there is indications of specific pathology and what i mean by specific pathology are things like uh, axillal spondyloarthritis, or uh, kind of presentations of uh, you know, potential gouts in in kind of peripheral joints, um, particularly if if blood work is un- is uncertain. When you're considering things that respond well to a specific treatment, which is often medical management, so axillal spondyloarthropathy, starting on biologics, if there's uncertainty around gout, we might want to whether we do ultrasound, whether we do, do x-ray um, to understand if there is presence of cup so we can start on the appropriate medical management. And finally, that point around if imaging is going to change your management. And, and I think the key thing here is we shouldn't just be imaging when someone's not getting better. We need to be thinking, okay, so this person's not getting better and there is... Oh, sorry, my, my phone's just going off. Don't know if you can pick that up. Um, but it's across the room. If you can't pick it up, if you if you can't hear it, then I'll just carry on. Um, so the, well, as I say, the change of management. So we should be thinking this person's presentation, not only are they not getting better, but equally there is a good evidence-based intervention that we should be, we should be considering um, and involving the person in that discussion. So like I said previously around would the person go on to have said treatment if they wouldn't? I mean, we probably suggest to them that we we wouldn't be doing the wouldn't be doing the imaging. Um, if they were willing to do so, then I think it's important we do do that imaging. Um, so those are probably the a, a broad term when I think we should be should be considering it for non traumatic um, presentations. A really interesting one, which I think is as physios we're a bit of attention for at the moment, the kind of um, acute onset of, of very impactful or severe sciatica. And that tension between do we have our eye, do we yeah. not? Um, so there seems to be a window of opportunity of, of, of scanning somebody with severe acute onset sciatica um, early that informs the decision around epidural or surgery. But we have this tension between not wanting to um, not wanting to image soon in, in patients with, with spinal presentations for some of the considerations of the the downstream effects and also learning from the back pain journey of the last 20 years or so um, and we also know that some patients with sciatica don't all need to have epidural or surgery but that we interface that and physiotherapy is not brilliant in terms of evidence for sciatica 
and we're there as the clinician trying to make sense of what we know from the from the data the person in front of us who's clearly struggling and i think really the way forward for that and and i think a really uh, nice strategy for managing uncertainty as a clinician is sharing your thought process with the patient so this is the presentation this is what the prognosis looks like this is the chance of recovery um these are some options non-surgically so we might try some, some medication to help with sciatica such as um such as a kind of tricyclic antidepressants such as um, amitriptyline we may um we may want to give this time we know that activity is good but equally there are invasive options which managed early particularly for the severity of your symptoms do well but they carry risks if we're thinking about that then we need to do an image and involving the person in that discussion so we make the right care for them as an individual and you could have two people with exactly the same signs and symptoms exactly the same level of impact one that ends up having an image because they're considering epidural surgery and one that says, no, I definitely won't have anything kind of injected into my spine or cut out my spine. I want to give it some time. Um, and therefore, you wouldn't image. So I think we need to really relate this back to the person that's sitting in front of us. Yeah, thank you for your answer. I, I, I think involving the patient can also be tricky because, uh, and, and, and yeah, it's definitely not black and white. And, and if I generalize, I would think a patient is inclined to rather have an image of his back than not. So I, I can imagine that, that this is tricky, but you kind of tie it together with surgical options or, or not. I think uh, that, that can also make a, a difference. Um, I'll share with you um, a, a finding that, that's kind of come out some of the, some of the qualitative work, um, which is really interesting. Uh, and again, I, I kind of give the context, this is a UK setting, um, so it may not be the same elsewhere in, in the world. But what was really interesting is that if you, when I started the qualitative work, I had exactly the same kind of assumption that the patients would be the ones expecting imaging, yeah. whether it be back pain, knee pain, or, or shoulder pain. Um, and what was really kind of reflective, I suppose, was that the patients weren't really that fussed about imaging per se. What the patients wanted was a working understanding of what was going on. Um, that might include imaging, it, it, it may not. And there was a clear sense from them that as a professional, you probably should be able to get an idea of what's going on from speaking to me about my symptoms and examining no. me and finding out my signs. But when imaging was suggested, when the imaging came up in their episodes of care, it was always suggested by a clinician. And there was this estimate of, well, I wasn't thinking about imaging, but then the clinician said to me, well, we could scan this or we could x-ray this. Um, and then it got me thinking, could there be something else going on? Because if the if the clinician is thinking yeah. about imaging, are they worried about something? And now it's been, the thought's been put in my head, maybe that should be something I pursue. So yes, there's definitely this, this impact of patient expectations, but there is definitely something for us as professionals to think about well, where's that belief come from? Um, and there seems to be, particularly in the cohort of patients that I interviewed, that it was the image it was the clinician that had suggested imaging in the first place yeah we will definitely add that uh, qualitative paper to the transcript of this episode because i think people uh, are interested to read that um yeah absolutely. i would just say that um we haven't published this qualitative this qualitative oh, okay. work yet. yeah so um i mean i'm in the kind of the final stages of, of writing up my thesis so then once that writing's done um we'll be looking to publish this, this qualitative work so I've given a bit of a broad brush summary there. Um, the, the, the full paper that goes into some of the detail and the nuance a little bit further. Okay, great. We are going to take a quick break to thank this episode's sponsor. Are you a physiotherapy student or new graduate? The Chartered Society of Physiotherapy Student Conference is open for bookings now. Join them in person or online for a unique CPD opportunity. Hear from physiotherapy experts covering a range of specialisms, including sport and exercise, animal therapy, learning disabilities, dementia, and more. You'll be able to take part in panel discussions and workshops with the opportunity to present your own work for the chance to win up to 200 pounds. As a physiotherapy student, you know how important it is to build networks within the profession. Come along to connect with physiotherapists, students, and new graduates from across the UK and use these networks to kickstart your career. The conference is free for members, £49 for non-members. Perhaps this is the time to consider joining the CSP as membership is just 44.04 a year. It's a no-brainer. 
Sign up today at csp.org.uk slash studentconference23. Uh, if, if we move on and uh, we are looking uh, at the benefits of imaging, uh, my question is what can imaging show us and what can it not show us? Because I think the expectation in the past and, and I think also the expectation by a lot of patients is that imaging can show me the source of my pain. Um, so can you talk to us about that maybe? Yeah, of course. So I think that's a really, it, the first bit of, of that question of what can it not show, I think it's really, really simple. It can't show us pain, as, as you've alluded to. Um, it, it's usually better at ruling things out than it is ruling things in. So it's good at demonstrating the absence of a serious pathology or, or specific pathology. Um, and this is where this notion of changing management is is really up for interpretation. So... Is changing management referring for an invasive procedure? Probably. Is referring manage is changing management not referring for a procedure you were considering? Because when you've done the image, it hasn't shown the presence of that pathology that you were suspecting could be. Um, and this is 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 largely what the Christians were referring to in terms of change management is so open to interpretation. That might be another reason why. Um, we see this disconnect between what guidelines are saying and what then happens in, in practice. So what can it tell us? Probably the absence of things, so anything serious or specific, um, because, as we know, symptoms don't always correlate with what we see on imaging. We know that people that have never had symptoms will demonstrate changes on, on their imaging. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that's tricky to, to get across, So particularly to, to patients in a way that makes sense because of the, the kind of public health aspect of why is, what do patients think they can show as you say pain or the diagnosis um but from speaking to patients what they hope the imaging will provide in terms of benefit one is diagnosis that that does come through quite strongly and um, but there's also elements of of validation mm. patients talk about feeling reassured uh, patients hope that it provides a prognosis um and when we think of them back to this concept of changing management the majority i think all but one of the patients that I interviewed reflected that following the imaging, their treatment didn't change. They weren't referred for surgery. They didn't have an injection. They carried on with their treatment. The symptoms were still, still impactful, um, but they were still glad they had the imaging. Um, and that might be through validating their symptoms. Their experience is also kind of reassuring that um, as symptoms persist and they think, well, could there be something else going on here? Um, so although there's a, a kind of a, an undertone we see this on social media all the time about how imaging not being reassurance and we apply the fact of not being reassuring and um, there's definitely a perspective from a patient point of view that it can be reassuring yeah i would definitely agree with that uh, this is also what i i see in practice personally um and yes absolutely uh, so we talked about the positive aspects of imaging uh what are the risks of imaging yeah cool so um Risk, uh, yeah, the really obvious one. If you're going to radiate somebody, there's a radiation risk. So an X-ray always has that involved. Um, interestingly, lots of lots of people don't consider that there's radiation. It's a small dosage, but you should probably still be informed, no. particularly if we're if we're not using it for a purpose. So routinely X-ray upon arrival, for example, routinely X-raying somebody for osteoarthritis, it's probably worthwhile saying to them that this isn't what the guidelines say and we're exposed to use more radiation than it would be. If I was a, a patient, I'd want to be informed of that. Um, we typically just see the downstream effects or potential for downstream effects. So um, catastrophization, worry, um, changing in behavior. If we see you know, something's torn or something's pressing down or something's compressing, particularly if, we, if we're not careful with our, with our language. Um, so those are, are kind of obvious or kind of well-known um, effects really the i always find it interesting there's some data from america that shows the closer you live to an mri scanner the more likely you are to have surgery uh, on your back um, and that uh, so that's the other risk is that if you have an imaging you're more likely to then go on to have an invasive procedure whether that be an injection or surgery um, and it that's one of my earlier point despite that what we don't see is any improvement in outcomes so there's some work looking at patients with acute lower back pain uh, that have imaging versus a group that don't have imaging and they follow them up over time and there's absolutely no difference in, in outcomes. The only difference is that the group that had imaging had greater uh, healthcare utilisation. So they were more often seeing their GP, more often seeing their physio, taking more medication, 
Um, so there's a cost there to society in terms of providing that healthcare. There's also an impact upon the person's life. So rather than going out and enjoying their life and being with friends, family and doing things they enjoy, they're coming back to GP centres, they're coming back in the, to, to pharmacists, they're going back to the hospital. So there's an opportunity cost in, in that regard. Uh, and obviously one of the risks if over-imaging is, is, is cost and spend. Uh, whether that be through insurance or whether that be through kind of publicly funded healthcare service, um, there's not a you know a, a finite amount of an infinite amount of amount of money. If you're spending money in that direction, you're not spending money in another direction. Yeah, awesome. You you already answered to your follow up questions that I had about cost effectiveness. Oh, sure. Um, and uh, if uh, if we look at uh, risks, benefits, and costs in mind, uh, could you maybe briefly go over differences between different imaging techniques? Yeah, cool. Um, I suppose the obvious way to answer that question yeah, is, is twofold. Age imaging technique, uh, imaging modality, particularly again from an NHS setting, is charged at a different price. Uh, MRI typically being the most expensive and X-ray being the, the cheapest. Uh, and ultrasound varying somewhere in, in between. There, there's probably benefits in point of care ultrasound in terms of being cost effective and by point of care ultrasound I mean a clinician whether it be a physiotherapist or a doctor or other allied health professional that's trained in ultrasound they have the ultrasound machine within their clinic room um, and they can rather than referring for an ultrasound so you've got the the kind of the cost of the weight the referral the administrative process that be seen in the radiology department be scanned by a radiologist or sonographer reported on, sent back, brought the patient back. You could do all of them within, within one setting. And there's definite benefits to that, both from a, a quality of care point of view, but and also a, a kind of cost efficiency point of view. I do have some concerns, though, um, and I'm really glad I get to talk about this on the podcast because I think some of my kind of tweets or interactions upon social media can sometimes get misconstrued that I'm not a fan of, of, of points of care ultrasound. And I don't think that's, that, I think that's fur, couldn't be further from the truth. There's definite value in that, whether it be the, the situation I've just described, whether it be guiding procedures that historically would be done by a surgeon in secondary care. So I'm thinking here, so just hydrodilatation for the shoulder that could be done in, in a community setting. However, my concern is that as a profession and as a medical community, we're not learning the lessons from the back pain journey of the last 15, 20 years. And what I mean by that is, overusing imaging unnecessarily so we used to mri scans exponentially um during the kind of 90s early 2000s yes we're still seeing the scanning going up by the way but i think we're a little bit more aware of some of the the nocebic effects or hydrogenic effects that I've, that i've already mentioned are we not learning those lessons when we think therefore of putting an ultrasound machine in a room with a patient, with a clinician, and using it routinely with every patient that comes through. And that's my concern. And I see it in practice. So if you've got a list of, of, of patients and every single one of them, you're putting the ultrasound probe on, I would say that's not good practice. No. The the argument that back is, oh, it's an extension of my arm. Why wouldn't I? It's there. I get more information. Um, but I can think of a clear example. I was in clinic with an individual who does point of care ultrasound. Uh, a young girl came in January, February time, slightly overweight, typically New Year, went to the gym, did too much, and she developed telephemoral pain. Clear as day, the subjective history pointed towards it, examination pointed towards it, you know, a, a, almost a typical case of telephemoral pain. Um, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, so we're about to start the rehab conversation, we're about to start the, the conversation around load management, we're starting to think about the kind of the rehab program we're going to put into place. So, okay, right, on the bed, we're just going to put your ultrasound probe on. And now, that is not going to change your management. You, you know what the diagnosis is. And equally, what then played out was, okay, you've got a bit of degeneration under your patella. There's a small bit of uh, a tear in your cartilage here. Um, and then the conversation about the rehab, then the conversation about load management. And I'm thinking there's absolutely no benefit to what of, of putting that ultrasound probe on the knee. There's only risk of, of the negative. So for me point of care ultrasound adds value but it only adds value when we're not using it routinely with every single patient if we're using it with every single patient because it's there because i can do it then i think in that circumstance we run a greater risk of seeing similar uh, downstream effects and poor outcomes of patients than what we saw when we we, we kind of did the same for the for the spine and we were referring for the imaging 
So my plea for those point of care ultrasonographers out there and clinicians that can do ultrasound is just be a little bit more reasoned and judicious with with your use. Um, and you might be listening to this and thinking, no, that doesn't reflect to me, which is absolutely fine. I'm glad to hear it. Um, but that's my that's my view on points of care ultrasound. Okay, great. And, and my follow up question that I had prepared already is: Would you suggest physios to get into ultrasound? Does it does it make sense to learn it? Because it's quite a, a process, and you need to do a lot of imaging until you're proficient. I think Andreas and I we had like a day, which was just kind of you know like a crash course, and we saw how difficult it can be to interpret. Uh, I think this is I think this is a really nice point actually around the governance around it. And in the UK, the Charles Society of Physio last year, yeah, last year, about this time last year, um, put out a guidance document on kind of training for, for, for ultrasonography because there was huge variation. He said you could do a day's course, you could do a weekend's course, you could do a postgraduate certificate. Um, I think if we're going to be training for taking on more ultrasound as a profession, then I think we should be aiming to be at that postgraduate certificate level. I don't think weekend courses or day-long courses are beneficial yeah. because we run the risk of, we know with ultrasound, it's very much dependent upon the operator. Um, this was something that was previously at the kind of only or exclusively done by by kind of radiologists um, and we therefore need to be demonstrating that if we're doing this we've got to be doing it to a, a high level so that we can undertake the or, or kind of realize the benefits that I, that I previously outlined of when it's in your clinic room with you you've got the patient you've got the a clear understanding of their presentation their examination and then you're adding that additional information in certain circumstances, that makes perfect sense. And I think it adds real quality and real value to the patient care, but also the healthcare system. If we're using it routinely with every single patient and the risks that come with that, like I've already outlined, they're further amplified if we haven't got that um, skill that comes with um, kind of a high level of training, a high number of cases, um, given how open it is to be done poorly if you don't take the time to develop that skill set. And I know uh, Richard Collins, who's a sports medicine consultant, speaks really eloquently um, and really passionately about maintaining and, and driving those standards um, to, to in order to um, kind of realise the potential that comes with more training with ultrasound. So I, I predict the time in the future, particularly during my career and our career time, that I think more clinicians will be doing ultrasound eventually than aren't. That's my prediction. Yeah, I think that's also the development that we're seeing in, in the Netherlands as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and as long as we as long as we learn the lessons that from history, um, as long as we use it when it adds value and not with every single patient that comes through, I think that's a good thing. Um, at the moment, I don't think that's the case. Now, and if we look at other imaging techniques, and, and, and that's probably not something that we're going to perform, but would it make sense for physios to learn how to interpret X-rays uh, MIs or ultrasound images, like if I don't do the ultrasound, but a patient comes in with the imaging findings, would it make sense that we yeah, spend more time on, on in learning to interpret these results? I think it depends. I think it depends on, on where you work and the setting that, that you work in. Um, so I work in what we refer to as a community setting. So we take referrals from from GPs or patients can self-refer to us. Um, but we we see patients before they end up in the hospital, before they see the orthopedic surgeons. In that setting, um, we definitely have clinicians that I work with that can, can interpret imaging. But the majority of us don't or can't. And this is where it, I think it's fairly controversial because there's this concept of, well, you should if you can't interpret the image itself you shouldn't be requesting it um, and i get that argument i think that makes sense um, but equally when we think about the reporting so you've got radiologists or radiographers that have trained for many years looking and taking good images reporting images really well governed process of telling you what it sees i think we have to trust in that governance and not be arrogant enough to think that doing a master's module or doing a weekend course gives us the same level of skill set. So I'm fairly comfortable for the majority of patients if I send for an x-ray or send for an MRI scan and I get a report back um, to trust the report because I don't. I think we're on shaky ground, particularly medically legally, if we were then to 
provide an explanation to a patient that was maybe a different interpretation of image compared to a consultant radiologist who's done a lot more training, seen a lot more images and a lot more reporting than I ever have or ever will. Um, so I think it depends. If you know, for example, but if you were working in a hospital-based setting where you were referring for the image and it came back in a time that was quicker than and needs to be quicker than a radiologist would report it, then definitely you need to be able to interpret that interpret that image or why are you why are you referring for it? Um, when a clinician comes to me within my role and asks to go on imaging interpreting courses, if the question I ask back is, this is for me a real added extra. This is something that shouldn't be a part of our core skill set. What should be a part of our core set is absolutely nailing communication skills, absolutely nailing that ability to deliver personalised care, to share risk with a person, to empathise, to build a therapeutic relationship, um, to examine to a high level alongside that uh, kind of subjective grounding that gives us a working hypothesis. We should then be able to critically appraise the evidence upon which we're making that working hypothesis to be able to understand the evidence and apply it to the individual in front of us in a critical manner to communicate that in a way that makes sense to the patient involved in the decision to have the educator skills to be able to not just give information to patients or tell them what to do but to work with them say so develop an understanding so they can um, be kind of uh, activated within the consultation to then be able to apply a treatment whether that be um the educational program itself treatment delivery whether it be the exercise program that's appropriately dosed aligned to a goal so what i'm trying to paint here is there's lots of more skills related to high quality good value muscular skeletal care than being able to interpret an image oh. for me if you're at the very if you've if you've nailed all of those core skills which i think is a career's worth of work um but you get it to a fairly decent standard across all all of those domains, then amaging, adding imaging interpretation is a bit like a cherry on the top. But if you're not an expert communicator, if we haven't got that research capability, if you haven't got the skill set to be able to educate a person that not only are you giving them information, but they learn, they undertake, and they can apply it to themselves as individuals, then I think time is better spent in your professional development in those areas than it is learning to interpret an image. Yeah, so what you're saying is we should rather spend on stuff that is more important than becoming really good at interpreting imaging. That's probably less of a concern. Yes, I, I, I think no. so. Because if you haven't got good communication skills, but you've interpreted the image, how are you going to relay that information to the patient in a way that makes sense um, and adds value to their care episode and improves their outcome? Um so for me, it's always an added extra. I don't think it's a core skill for the majority no. of clinicians working in the setting that I work in. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, the next question, uh, you, you already alluded to that. Uh, how should we explain imaging findings to patients? Because that's, I think, pretty challenging. And what I often find is that patients sometimes get a very bio biomedical explanation by the one undertaking the, the imaging so I kind of have to yeah I don't know ch change the narrative a, a little bit around it H how do you do that yeah really good question um and I don't think we do this very well as, as a profession um so I'll take you back to my kind of the qualitative work that, that we've just done um to so do with patients and, and clinicians um back pain knee pain and shoulder pain a variety of, of kind of uh aspects of the care journey so some people have been scanned some people had expected a scan but, but hadn't been and some have been referred for a scan but hadn't had it. So kind of a whole diversity around that care experience. Um, and what was really interesting, every clinician that we interviewed said that they try and contextualise the um, the scan prior to referring. So that we're sending you for a scan, we're looking for this very specific thing. Lots of things will come back on the scan, wrinkles, grey hair, you know, we know in asymptomatic populations, we see these things. Um, every single Christian said it. The flip side, every single patient said, no, don't remember, don't remember that conversation. No one gave me any information. They just told me I was going for an image. Um, and then equally, but when speaking to the patient, can you tell me what the image showed? Oh, I, I don't know. 
And it comes back to probably my, my previous answer. And that means that we're probably not communicating in a way that's effective or well enough for that to, to land um, in a way that the person can make sense of it, understand it, comprehend it and recall it. So communication, I think, is probably a, a tricky bit there. The other flip side of things that comes back with it is how clinicians then went about actually um, sharing the answers. And there was a difference in, in, in approach here. So some clinicians would only provide... Um, the outcome relevant to the question that they asked. So if they were looking for uh, a rotator cuff tear and the image came back and said there wasn't rotator cuff tear, then what they say to the patient, we've got your image results, the good news is the rotator cuff's intact and they wouldn't go any further. Some clinicians felt it was their um, kind of their duty to go through line by line of what the report showed. So this is your lower back, it's broken down by different levels. This level here is L2-3, this is kind of high up in your back. This shows there's some, some age-related changes that we would expect to see on a scan, but your nerves look really healthy at that level, at L3-4, L4-5, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they kind of come back and say, and what we were looking for was, was there any nerve root compression on the left-hand side that would explain the symptoms coming down to your leg? Yes, we can see that, and these are the options. Now, the, the aligned to that second group of people that went line by line, part of the rationale was, well, Particularly, again, in, in a NHS and UK setting, patients will soon have access to all of their medical records. So they will be able to, in time, see these imaging reports themselves. And if you've just said there's no, you know, the scan hasn't shown this, then you have that potential of the, the patient going, well, why don't you tell me about what was going on at L23? Because there's a word there that says stenosis. I don't know what stenosis means. Should I be worried about mm-hmm. stenosis? Have I got a stenosis? Um, so that's, that, that's a, a, a challenge for the future. The other challenge for the future is if somebody else picks up the imaging reports that isn't maybe a specialist in musculoskeletal care, so if a general practitioner says, okay, I see you had a MRI scan in your back last year, oh, crikey, it's probably the worst scan report I've ever seen, and the impact that that has upon upon the patient. And so we've got to be careful with that. And and that equally, that kind of feeds into the, the kind of rational and, and reasoned use of imaging we've got to consider we won't be the only person explaining the or potentially the only person explaining these imaging findings to a patient although i think as a profession we sometimes say i will do the image because it's better in my hands because i can make it sense it to the patient rather than x other professional who will just do the scan and scare the patient um but my qualitative work seems to suggest that even though we think we're doing it it doesn't land very well um so there's elements of, of how we of how we do that. Um so I think we need to consider when we're communicating how much detail and back to one of my early points, a way of doing that is, is asking the patient. So I could go how how what do you want to know? Right. We've got this report that's come back, there's lots of information on it. I can go through it line by line with you, or I could say what's relevant to your symptoms. What what do you think? Um and, if, and you'll get a, a, a mix of opinion, I'm sure. Some patients will want to know absolutely everything and some will just want the question answered. Just tell me, am I having an operation, yes or no? Um, so I think there's 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 different ways you can you can do it and that's reflected in practice at the moment. Yeah, awesome. Um, I'm looking at the time a little bit and uh, and and at my list of questions and I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm through them. So uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, is there anything else that we haven't touched upon yet uh, that you would like to talk about or that you would like to mention from your research? Um, is there anything else? Want to talk? No, I, I don't think so. I think we've had a really nice, quite a wide-reaching um, conversation. Um, I've touched a little bit on the, some of the qualitative work today. I'll probably just say that when we do publish, there'll be two papers that, that come out. When we do publish them, um, I'll share them with you so you can yeah. share them with your, your listeners. Um, they add it to the show notes or onto your, onto your usual educational platforms. Um, but the, the two scoping reviews we've touched upon in terms of one around guidelines, the second one we haven't touched too much upon, that was around uh, information out there for for patients if they went on to Google, which is an interesting read. I'm sure they'll be linked to in the show notes. Um, but if anybody wants to contact me for any questions or to expand upon anything I've said, I'm more than happy to be to be contacted by uh, kind of usual social media channels. Yeah, that, that was my very last question. Where can people find you? So uh, maybe you can share your Twitter handle uh, to people so they can contact you. I, I don't use Instagram because I'm just out of touch with society. Um, but I do use Twitter, which is my hashtag is Andrew V Cuff. So that's C-U-F-F. Um, and I tweet more than I more than my Instagram. 
Okay, uh, Andrew, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge here. It, it was a pleasure to have you. And uh, with that, I want to say thanks a lot for listening to this episode. To all the listeners out there and uh, to access the transcript and additional resources, make sure to sign up for a free PhysioTutors membership on physiotutors.com and also benefit from more useful physio content. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button or follow our podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and consider leaving a review if you really enjoyed it. And with this being said, this was Kai for PhysioTutors and I'll talk to you in the next podcast episode. Bye.